me in, in my career. I've had a marvelous, wonderful career, uh, storybook career, and painting. And um, it's a point in my life where I, but I still paint, and I love to paint. I probably will never stop painting, but I'm no longer pushing a career. So my work is still in a couple of galleries of, because they won't let me go. <laughs> um, my main thrust is gardening, uh, other than the painting, is gardening and photographing wildflowers. Well, that's, <laughs> that's why I <laughs> come up here. We're still, it's still too early, but a wonderful person is going to show me where I will find these lilies and, and orchids later, <coughs> wild orchids, of course. Um, <coughs> yeah, I, um, I gave uh, a couple of workshops up here years ago. Years ago. I didn't earn my living doing workshops, but I would do them occasionally. <coughs> and I've met some of the nicest people in the world during doing workshops over the years. Made many wonderful friends and acquaintances, and I have seen a lot of wonderful country in the process. Uh, <coughs> as far as, <coughs> excuse my voice, I'm getting old there too. Uh, the career really took off because I specialized. Now back in the, um, the late 50s, I, everyone had said, you, you'll never make a living as an artist you know, until you teach or something. And so I, I got a credential in college to teach uh, elementary school, actually, or art school, I mean art classes, high school, whatever. I ended up teaching fifth grade, which I dearly loved. And I did that for about 12 years before I could make a living as an artist. But by 1968, I was making more from it as an artist than I was as a school teacher with a master's degree. So that's when we quit, and my wife June was here somewhere. Um, and I moved to uh, Mendocino in 1968 and uh, took a leave of absence from the teaching because I didn't know whether I'd make it or not, but every year got better. Specializing is extremely important in, in your, if you're in a career thing. If you're just Sunday painting, God bless you, I love that. That's wonderful, that's what I do now. Tuesday painting or something like that. <laughs> um, if you're really serious about developing your work, it is, it is probably better to specialize because eventually somebody will look across the room and say, oh, well, that belongs to so-and-so. I, I can tell from here that it's so-and-so's work. I recognize it because of the subject and the brush strokes and so on. So I specialize in seascapes. And back in a time when there were no books on seascape, no videotapes, because there, was no, there were no videotapes anyway. <laughs> But I got a movie camera, and I went out to, um, out to Bodega Bay, and uh, I filmed with this movie camera, and took it home, with, because the blasted waves wouldn't stand still for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the movie camera, I was able to, to develop uh, a sense of what was happening. And I got a hold of some books on oceanography, and... Uh, articles and this and that, and finally learned the anatomy of the waves, you must know what you're painting. If you just sit and, and, um, and paint Dutch windmills, you've never seen a Dutch windmill, you're not really doing justice to it or, or yourself. So you must know your subject. So I, I studied, studied, finally began to, and I paint, I worked very, very, very hard to get a good translucent wave. My rocks look terrible. The skies look terrible, but I was learning how to do the waves. You know, the rocks are like potatoes floating in And the skies are just sort of blue, that type of thing. But I began to develop a little more and a little more until finally the experience catches up with you. The technical side of it becomes easier. And once the technical side is easier, then the <coughs> spiritual side develops. The spiritual side, meaning you are saying something with your painting. It's not just picture taking. You've gone to picture making. So in other words, instead of just, here's a seascape, got some rocks and a wave and the sky and so on. Here's a seascape, <coughs> Lord, I feel something. That's the difference. And 
that only comes with paint, paint. <laughs> That's why I only sign my books that way. Paint, paint, because experience is what counts. But I better not rattle on <coughs> too long here. I'll never get going. <coughs> I like to paint on all of any journey we take. We never take a, a vacation that isn't a ride off home. <laughs> You know, in Hawaii, yeah, they sketches, you know, little water sketches, and take those, those journal notes and so on. And we have these little, I have these sketchbooks from everywhere. This little, there's a 10, 12 minute little sketch, you know. <laughs> it is, really. I'm, this is what I'm going to work on today. This is a little watercolor sketch. I think this is after I got home. Can I see? Yes. <laughs> okay. This is what I'm going to work on today. I'm going to stretch it a little bit. Because, you see, I'm not picture taking here. I'm picture taking. So I can do what I want. Okay. So that's basically it. Now, sometimes. Sometimes I start off by toning a, a canvas, or sometimes I don't. I'm not going to necessarily today. This is a gesso panel. <coughs> when I do smaller paintings, I want a little more detail. I, uh, I generally use a gesso, gesso panel so that I can get some detail. Whereas heavier canvas texture that just sort of prevents that. I used to working with it up a little higher, but this won't go higher. Nevertheless, we're stretching this out. We've got some headlands out in here. You see, this is just brief information that's getting put in here. Now, you may feel free to ask me questions. Is that acrylic? This is oil. This is oil. Yes. Do you always sketch with the paint, or sometimes you draw it on? Hmm? Do you always sketch your sketch, your initial sketch with the paint? Yes, yes. I do that. Is that French ultramarine blue? That's French ultramarine. Yes. Do you always lay it out with that, or you? Pardon? Do you usually lay it out with that? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. But, you know, whatever works. Is, uh, is the palette that you're working with in your books, or are you? Uh, um. Yeah, I'll explain that in a bit here. Uh, the palette, it's, all I'm doing is outlining. You can use anything you want that's not going to later interfere. And you don't have to excuse my back because I can't paint this way. <laughs> <laughs> From time to time, I will step out of the way. And you'll see what the progress of what's going on. See, I'm not the least bit. I'm not the least bit interested in making an exact copy. And that helps a great deal because then I'm not inhibited. And then that way I don't have to write number six here and number three. <laughs> 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 See, the sunlight is coming from this side, so that <laughs> influence the, <clears throat> the painting also. But no kidding, uh, you really do need to establish where, where your sunlight is prior to anything that you do. Now, one thing about seascape painting, I think a lot of people leave out, is a sense of motion. The motion is not just in the way that's crashing over at all. It is in the composition itself. So if you have some lines that are doing this here, notice this, the line of the rock basically does the same as this. But then here comes some clouds doing this. So what you end up with is this kind of a motion. <coughs> this little wave is going to roll over this way. 
So you have this and this and this and it, what does the ocean do? It sways, it swells, and so on. These are what I call spirit lines rather than outlines. You know very well this is an outline of a rock if you just go on the outside part. But there's a there's a a direction to that. There's a direction to the headlines. There's a direction to everything in here. And those are the spirit lines. Those are the things that I'll lead the eye around the composition. So my point is, with seascape painting, you certainly want motion. You don't want <coughs> static. Now, if you're doing a large panorama of a beach that's a mile long, and these long, low, low breakers like you have, you can see out here sometimes, and, and you want a restful repose, then maybe you just want basically horizontal lines for that feeling of rest. But I have seen people not aware of this trying to do a restful painting, and they put a whole bunch of, of trees over here into nervous lines, <laughs> and it destroys the, the feeling. So yeah, just be aware of these things. Now this is just information here, and for me, and. Uh, gives me an idea of what direction I'm going, which may be straight down. I'm not sure. <laughs> <clears throat> then we can get busy painting. Now, at first, I just scrub things in. I'm not interested in, in the final layer, so to speak. Think of it, uh, the women especially. Think of it in terms of building a cake. You cannot frost or ice the cake unless the bulk is there in front of you. So why with painting do we think that we can put all the detail in before we have something underneath? So this is my thinking is it scrub in, for example, let's say, I like to start with scrubbing in the darks. This establishes the, the darkest dark in the painting because if I started up here with the sky and I got it too dark, then everything else would get darker and darker, wouldn't it? <laughs> so if you put your darkest dark in first, you're assured that you're not going to get your values too close together. So you know what makes a wonderful rock color besides brown, which so many, many people love to use? Payne's gray. Uh, that's a dirty word. Now, <laughs> now let some of you use things, right, and think, oh, it looks pretty good. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a combination of a lizard crimson and sap green. You could, all, you could use viridian or any dark green, and you could then tilt it. You see, when you're using a red and a green, they're compliments, aren't they? And when you use a red and a green, you can tilt it towards the red for warmth, tilt it towards the green for cool. And of course, then you can add anything else in there if you want, besides. Okay. So, you know, see, I kept the direction of my rock pointing this way, here, and this one points back up that way, basically, because it seems to say, boom. <coughs> now, I'll establish a bit of the dark also of the water, and for water in a seascape, if you want a translucent or transparent effect, Looking down, transparent. The sunlight coming through a wave is translucent, so, you know, light like right here. If you want that, keep the white out of it. So many people say, oh, well, I'll lighten it with some white, and it immediately goes opaque. So I'm going to use ultramarine blue and viridian for some, just a little bit of trans parent effects at water.
tiny bit of a green I hesitate to mention because it can be overdone. <laughs> it's a phthalo green. You know? <laughs> uh, if I get into a little tiny bit of the phthalo green and a little touch of white with it, then I can get the effect I want of a translucent water. I'll move out of your way in a second. And even echo a bit of that here and there. See what happens? But I didn't I didn't mess up the basic transparent green with any white at all. If there was a Halloween of uh, seascape painting, I'd be that one how at least tip of the day. Keep white out of your transparent <coughs> colors. <coughs> Way in the foreground Paint thinner, and I don't really like the smell of uh, turpentine all these years. And um, paint thinner is <coughs> like six times cheaper than turpentine, and it's basically the same toxicity. Which <laughs> you still need ventilation in your studio. It isn't as toxic as some things, of course, but uh, I knew a. Uh, Look at the textures that just happen with this. You know? They just happen. You scrub it on, and there are some gesso textures underneath. It just happens. And I can come back later and I can fill in little shadows and cracks and crevices. Mr. Robinson, do you ever use alcohol? Or just tone this down, or just change its texture, or whatever, or make it, or, you know, on, on gesso board, you can scratch in a highlight if you wish. So on, yeah. I use anything that achieves an effect that I want. Um, I, years and years ago, I've even, I even experimented with um, um, modeling paste made from marble dust and mm -hmm. build up a texture uh, to paint over for, for rocks. But How'd that work out? Well, I don't do it. Try to collect it. Dark, and the dark seem to be working somewhat okay. It's not a great, uh, it's not a great value composition at this point, but uh, it's all right. I think. Now, with a bit of cerulean blue and white. Um, kind of scrub in a bit of sky color. Just scrub, scrub. You know, detail comes later. I may want to get a little bit darker with that. Up in here. Scrub, scrub for now. When you say darker, did you add a compliment or more? No, I added all for a Yeah. Extremely important. The, the, the real ingredients to a painting, um, besides the subject itself, is sunlight, which includes shadow and bounced light, and then atmosphere, because you see through atmosphere. For example, when I get to this point here, painting the headlands, I know that those headlands are the same color as these walls. But they're lighter because we're looking through atmosphere. But you don't just add white to it. You add your atmosphere color to it. Because you're looking through that color, not pure white. And a lot of people miss that point. Yes. 
You know, actually not, unless I'm just doing what is considered a vignette. A vignette being, uh, you just you just choose a certain amount of area you're going to paint, and you don't paint the rest of the canvas at all. But um, you, and there's no reason why you couldn't. But most people would. If I left this just the gesso here, for example. It, I think if somebody looked closer and said, why didn't you finish it? The <laughs> <laughs> sky area near the horizon, it's always lighter, so I've added more white. And there's a little touch of green in this, by the way. We don't, you know, it, it's not going to look like a green sky, I don't think. We hope not. And for the, um, for the cloud area, I'm going to ultramarine blue again and white. And I want to just, you know, I think I'll warm it up with a touch of alizarin crimson. And uh, the underside will be darker. And again, it's just scrub scrub. In, in art school, we had a, a professor, I guess, a, a German fellow. He'd come along and he'd, and to all of us being art, he'd squabble the bush, squabble the bush. And quit kicking, squabble the bush. So, I'm still squabbling the bush. A little more. This run wouldn't hurt just for warmth. <coughs> Sunlight is rarely quite light. Depends on the time of day, but usually, usually morning light and evening light are yellow to oranges. And you can always tell. <coughs> At sunset, for example, <coughs> at sunset, you um, turn away from the ocean and turn towards a white building. You can see an orange cast or a yellow cast. That gives you an idea that sunlight carries color. And so whenever you paint something that's white in your painting, it should have some of that sunlight color in it rather than just pure white foam. <coughs> And mid midday, it's almost it's more of a lemon yellow, just a touch of it in the white. You know, it's warmer in the morning, gets a little cooler and cooler, kind of a lemon. And then, of course, the blue of the sky, if there is blue sky, adds a little something to it. You know, cools it down even more. <clears throat> and then a, just a touch of the rock color. This color right here, the red grain, with the atmosphere, gives me this color right here. So there's a headland that really is seen through atmosphere. Now I'll make this next one a little darker. The same atmosphere color. with a little touch of the rock color. More, more rock color here.
didn't want it to be that scrubby. Um, some artists would leave it this way because it's impressionistic. So what I do is I use a Tebow brush. Uh, either, now oh, maybe it's gone up, it's 99 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, uh, I don't paint with it. I merely blend it down a bit, knock it back, and I get rid of those brush strokes in the desert. <laughs> Soften some edges because you're looking through atmosphere. You do not want um, you do not want to see hard edges in the distance. This is one way you can always tell somebody copying a slide or a photograph. A camera is monocular, so it has one eye. It sees everything equally from here to there, from there to there. But we're binocular. We only see things in sharp focus if we are focusing on it. Yeah, everything out here is a little bit blurry. Especially as you get older. But <laughs> even you, right. so, it, <laughs> so the idea is distance really, distance really ought to be uh, softened down. Especially if you paint under the assumption that center of interest in your painting is a good thing. Some people don't do that anymore. But, uh, I still do. I believe in the focal point and with things leading towards and so on. Now this is sort of soft in the background, but it depends on atmosphere also. You need to Keep in mind that that at atmosphere really influences everything in your painting, but especially the distance. Now, the only thing that goes darker than that, well, everything that comes forward goes darker than that. <laughs> but the swells that I'm going to chop in here in a moment. And definitely will be darker. Brush it a little bit like this. Understand? So when I chop in some swells back here, mm -hmm. they will be a little darker to soften and then fade into the color of water below. That's the opposite of a a breaker <coughs> in that do I have a breaker here? It is darker at the bottom and lighter at the top because you see sunlight can come through the thinner section of water. And when you see these fabulous seascapes in Hawaii and other exotic places that are transparent or translucent from the top all the way down to the bottom, <laughs> you know that they're not paying attention. There's no way that wave could be skinny all the way down to the base. But they sound like heck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I keep saying it. <laughs> Let's see if I can cut in a little bit of some swells in the background, the ultramarine blue. Excuse the back. Get in here and see where the heck I am. Notice how I hold my brush? Not the point, the edge. And that way I have better control. If I use, hit the edge, or the point of it rather, if I hit, use the point, I'm going to dig through what I've already painted and it's going to blend and go muddy. And of course, none of you can make muddy paint. <laughs> go right back to my sunlight color. I always used to tell students, mix up a pile of sunlight and a pile of atmosphere. And then mix up a, like a yellow white or an orange white. Have it there ready for you because you're going to need it again. 
not just for the clouds up in here, but here, for example. Sunlight's from this direction, it's right here, coming in. And uh, it's going to go in. But, like I said, I'm not going to make it the same white all the way across. It's going to pick up a little shadow here on the sun. And that makes it, to me, much more interesting than if it was all white. I always like to throw another one in, too, so that it doesn't look just like a beard hanging down. <laughs> Well, you learn the hard way. I had a, a total painting in my very early career, and they called me back, and they said, it looks like Santa Claus' beard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very insulted. <laughs> and I looked at it and said, yeah, it does. <laughs> so I always like to add uh, a little more something going on. <laughs> thin enough and spray is thin enough you're going to see the color of the rock behind it so it's it's kind of uh, another little halloween skin <laughs> And the winner is Tom Broderick. that I have. Tom and I bought this painting, which is a very large painting, uh, in 1982. So uh, this will add to our collection. <laughs>